Amen. Good morning, Cornerstone Church. We greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. And we come knowing and believing that our God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. We thank God for each and every one of you. And again, we know things are tough and things are rough, uh, but we pray that you're keeping your trust in our Lord and Savior and that he will see you through. We're going to open up with a word of prayer on this day, and we pray uh, that all of you are safe with your families. And we also want to give a nod to our graduates here at Cornerstone. Uh, we thank God for them. We'll be honoring them here real soon, Sister Miller and I and the church. Uh, we have not forgotten you. We do love you, and congratulations on your accomplishment. And we will be reaching out to those parents and those children to say thank you, God, for what you've done for them. And pre we pray that even though you didn't get to walk as you normally would have, uh, that you found a way to celebrate and to enjoy. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, dear God, for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Uh, we thank you for your manifold blessings, O oh God. And we ask you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would touch us, O oh God, on this day and in this worship service, that uh, your word will go forth with boldness and with clarity. Speak to us, O oh God, as only you can. Fill us with the precious Holy Spirit that he might take us down in the depths and treasures of your word. Oh God, we love you, we adore you, we magnify you, and we praise you. We pray for this praise team as they come. We pray for all that are here. We thank you for these engineering brothers who are here helping us out, Father God. We thank you for our deacons who are laboring consistently and constantly. Then, oh God, we ask you to take your word over the airways, over the internet, and let it accomplish what you shall have it to accomplish. These and many other blessings we ask in your darling son Jesus' name. We do pray. Amen. Now you'll hear from our worship team. God bless you.
Father God, we thank you for filling our hearts with praise. And there's a reason why we praise you, oh God, is because you've been so good. Oh Lord, you've been so good and, and so faithful that even in the midst of the storm, we have a reason and a right to praise you. And we thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. Now, Father, we thank you for blessing us with this ministry, with the effort of so many and the faithfulness of so many. Not only here at Cornerstone Church, but every church that's doing the mandate of getting your word across to 
for those who cannot make it through the doors and for others who've, who've never heard your son Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that has been given on Calvary's cross. Now, Father, we ask that you would have your way in this place. Bless us, those that are here and those that are listening and watching. Father, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit and help us to lay aside every sin and every weight that may be trying to beset us in the name of Jesus. Oh God, give us strength. Give us the wisdom that we need to navigate the turbulent waters of confusion and chaos that we might continue to be a blessing to your people. And then, oh God, we pray that your word will have its free course in the hearts and minds of all mankind. Thank you, Father. We bless you, O oh God, and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And we ask it all. Amen and amen. Again, it continues to be an honor and a privilege to stand and to preach God's word, even in your absence and in your not being here. It's a wonderful and wonderful time that we have and sharing God's word, which lets us know that the church has never been about brick and mortar, but the church has always been in the hearts and minds of God's people. And we thank God that that is the way his church is intended uh, to be. And so we thank God for all of our members who are watching, family and friends, we thank you. And we also thank you for all of your words of encouragement uh, that you've given us that are here. And we pray for every church and every pastor. Uh, that is in this time and season serving and laboring alongside of us. We're all in this thing together and we know and we believe that our God has not forgotten about us and he's still able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. I'd like to turn your attention this morning to a couple areas of scripture and we'll try to bring this all together. Amen. First, I'm going to start out with Acts chapter 1. I'm going to read one verse that says verse 8 out of Acts chapter 1 verse 8 and then we will jump over to Acts chapter 3 which will be the primary text this morning. I'm going to only read two verses, uh, verses 9 and 10 but we also pray uh, that in your quiet times and moments of meditation that you will consider uh, all of Acts chapter 1 and all of Acts chapter 3. Amen. You may as well check out Acts chapter 2. Amen. And that you will get a complete rendering of where the Lord will have us to go on today. Again that's Acts chapter 1 verse 8 and then we will jump over to Acts chapter 3 verses 9 and 10 to hear what the Lord is saying to us on this day. I am reading from the NIV version of the Bible. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. Turn with me if you will to Acts chapter 3 verses 9 and 10. Acts chapter 3 verses 9 and 10. Uh, Read this way. Uh, when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. Acts 1 and 8 says, you shall be my witnesses. I want to form our subject today in the form of a question. What in the world is the church to be? What in the world is the church to be? Those who are here, you may be seated in the presence of an almighty God. What in the world is the church to to be in our day and time persons are confusing the church with many things uh, but not much of it has to do with what the Lord has called for us to be and if you read the scripture with me you already know at least one answer one of the things that the Lord has called for his church to be in the world is a witness and my brothers and my sisters, if you study scripture and if you have lived any length of time, you should know by now that God always leaves a witness to his awesome power. Even the children of Israel were witnesses to what God can do. 
and our parents and forefathers of old are witnesses to what the Lord can do. The church is called at least one way to be in this world is a witness. When you understand the context of the text, you know that in Acts chapter 1, the power of the Holy Spirit was promised uh, to the birth of the church, the early church. They would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they were to then be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. When you get to chapter 2, the promise was manifested as the Holy Spirit descended like tongues of fire upon them as they were waiting on the manifestation on the day of Pentecost. And they then were endued with power. Don't let anybody tell you that there is no power in the church. The thing that you must be cautious about is this microwave mentality of ministry in which we don't think there should be any suffering or should be any heartaches or pains. But no, my brothers and sisters, God did not promise us a life filled with daisies and roses. No, for every rose and every flower, that means there was some rain somewhere. There will always be difficult days. And that type of theology and doctrine tends to mess folk up when trouble comes. You got to learn how to hold on to God's unchanging hand when trouble arises. The witnesses then receives power. And then when you get to our scripture text, we see the witnesses beginning to be witnesses. Text says, when you look at chapter 3, there was one day that Peter and John were heading to the temple at the time of prayer. And I can park there for just one second. And I like to emphasize the fact that witnesses know the power and priority of prayer. When you think about who was going to prayer, that was Peter and John. They indeed had witnessed Christ in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. So they themselves understood fully what the power of prayer can do. I don't think there's too many sermons I go by without mentioning the priority and power of prayer. And my brothers and my sisters, if prayer was good enough for us when we were five, it's good for us right now. And if there's anything we need the church to be as a witness is to know the priority and the power of prayer. Prayer. Prayer still works. I know the blood works, but I thank God that once the blood has done its job, that we have a prayer partners and we have a prayer component that lends us the opportunity to commune with the creator. We've got to understand that you and I must learn to have constant communication with the creator. We must always stay in communication with God. We must always stay prayerful, but yet that's the one thing we often neglect. I know I've done it myself. I ain't telling you nothing that I have not struggled with. It seems like there's always something getting in the way of prayer time. There's always something getting in the way. If it's not the kids, it's the job. If it's not the job, it's the other job. If it's not that job, it's the church. Church can get in your way of prayer. When you need to be praying, you need to be praying before you serve. Some folks serve and don't even pray. Listen, you've got to pray, choir member. You've got to pray, usher, before you're able to come back through these doors. Learn how to pray. Prayer produces power. Prayer still works and if we ever learn that there is indeed a need for prayer I hear us talking about everything we're trying to, to do everything but when are we going to have a Facebook prayer party? I wish I had a witness in here that every now and then we need to learn how to pray and get down to prayer. Don't worry about your weave falling out. Don't worry about your suit getting sweaty. We need to learn how to pray and pray without ceasing. You need to pray in Walmart. You need to anoint your house. You need to do everything. We need to learn how to pray. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal from heaven and heal their land. We won't heal in all kinds of ways, but we need to learn how to pray. The White House can't pray. They can't pray in Austin, right? The God called his people to pray. The church needs to pray and get it right. The church needs to fall down on its knees and pray to an almighty God. The church needs needs to learn how to get back in a prayer posture. They're opening things up but the churches are still closed. They're trying to force you back in. Ain't no sense in coming back in here if you don't know how to pray. You don't need to be in here to pray. You don't need to be in here to serve. You don't need to be in here to do anything. God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's omnipresent. He's at your house when you pray. He's at your job when you pray. He's in your car when you pray. You don't have to be in the Maybe that's what's wrong with us. We've gotten so used to being in here, we can't do nothing out there. You need to learn how to pray wherever you are. Pray with your eyes open. Pray with your mouth open.
open. Pray with your ears open. But pray with your heart open. Prayer is a dialogue, not a monologue. Give God an opportunity to talk back to you. Pray without ceasing. They were going to the temple at the time of prayer. Uh, as Jewish custom would have it, they had a morning, an afternoon, and an evening prayer. This particular prayer was called the Tamid, where they would go in and then they would love the opportunity to give alms to persons who were sitting at the side. They would, they would love the opportunity to, to brag and to boast about all they were doing. And the Bible says that they carried a certain beggar, a lame beggar, and they strategically positioned him outside the gate called beautiful. So that then means, my brothers and sisters, as they were making their way into the temple, they could not miss him on the perimeter. They could not miss the fact that this man who was laying from birth was sitting there day after day, day after day. The Bible says expecting to receive something from them, expecting that the church would do something. That's a good thing. I'm thankful that there's still an expectation that what's going on on the inside Side, uh, should have an impact on the outside. Uh, I'm not too upset that God has pushed us out these doors. Uh, if you know scripture and you understand theology, then you understand that God's intent whatever for us to come in and get so comfortable. Uh, I think we made the place too comfortable. Uh, back in the old church, they didn't have air conditioning and, and comfortable chairs and pews uh, and Starbucks coffee and bowling alleys uh, all in the church. They came to church when it was hot, when it was cold, uh, and they praised God. Uh, and that's how they made it through. They didn't walk into church and because the air was out, they couldn't stay. Because their favorite preacher wasn't preaching, they couldn't stay. They stayed with it. Peter and John were going to church, were going to the temple, and this lame man was sitting here on the perimeter. That takes me to my next point. Witnesses. Witnesses. If you're going to be a witness, you must know and understand that the work of ministry is not predicated upon the comfortability of, of the inside confines. That simply means that you ain't got to be comfortable to minister. You and I don't have to be comfortable to do everything the right way. People pass him by, but, but Peter and John stopped for just a few minutes. And if I could advise somebody that I learned in ministry, I used to walk fast. Well, I still walk fast, bless my heart. Uh, there was a lady at Mesquite Friendship, Mother Woods, she stopped me one day. I was motoring to do ministry <laughs> and, and she stopped me. She said, she said, Reverend, 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 Reverend. She said, slow down. I said, but I'm in a hurry to do ministry. She said, but you missing ministry. Do you see the hurting? Do you see that lady you walk by? She could be in a mess right now, but you so in a hurry to do ministry. <laughs> what I was in a hurry to do was get behind the desk. But she said, no, nah, see, what you need to be in a hurry to do is do ministry. Thank God for wisdom for mothers of the church. She said, slow down, young man. And then I've learned to slow down for just a few minutes and pay attention to what other people are going through. Peter and John did not speedily walk by this man. That's because as witnesses, they know that Jesus didn't speedily walk by them. Jesus stopped and took time to minister to their needs. They stopped and took time to minister to somebody else's need and then this hour of reckoning my brothers and sisters you and I are positioned to where we're on the perimeter now and we are positioned to help somebody else when are we going to learn that ministry ain't about ourselves it's about other people and now God has given us an abundance of people that need some help they're in your own families they need some help they're on your job they need some help if you stop for just a minute and take time to hear somebody else's cry and watch God work through you. I must admit, I still ain't got that thing perfected, but I'm trying my best to slow down and be patient and understand what other people are going through, especially if you are blessed. Bible says this man was carried to the temple of the gate called Beautiful where he was put every day and he was being passed by everybody. Yet when Peter and John saw him, he asked them for money. 
Peter then looked straight at him, focusing on him as John did. Then Peter said, look at us. And no doubt this man was anxious to understand and receive what they were going to give. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And then they bust their bubble. Peter and John said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Well, witnesses are also witnesses to the fact that a relationship with Christ has the power to produce change and has then the power to offer possibilities of a brand new start. This man has not walked his whole life and it takes me back as we were cleaning our dad's house this week. I remember when we brought little Harvey over there for his first birthday. And we've been trying to get him to walk. He had his wobble game on, but he couldn't quite, couldn't quite get it together. And for some reason, we sat him down in Paul Paul's house that day on his very first birthday. We sat him down and on his feet. We were trying to show Paul Paul that he at least had his wobble game together. But when we put him down on his two feet, the boy took off running. So the men and I looked at each other and said, he ain't done that yet. Well, as I think back on things and I can make that analogy, I guess he was waiting to get to the big father's house. And in his big father's presence, he said, I've got enough strength in these old young legs that I can get on up now and not just walk, daddy, but let me show you what God can do. See, when God gets ready to bring you out of a thing, he'll bring you out of the thing in totality. This man had never been taught to walk up. This man had never known how to walk up. But the Peter and John said, get up and I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to walk like you've been walking all of your life. See, when the Lord brings you out of something, it's as if you never even been in it. I wish I had somebody. We're sitting here waiting on everything to get done. When God gets ready, it will be as if you never even went through the thing. That's how good God is. When God heals you, you are indeed healed. And when God sets you free, you are indeed set free. For whom the Lord sets free, is free indeed get up and start walking witnesses understand that a relationship with Christ produces power to effect change so when you think about it my brothers and sisters what in the world is the church to be we are supposed to be witnesses when you think about it here at Cornerstone Church year or two back I started the year of preaching along the lines that God desires to make himself known and in God's desire to make himself known he plucked out the Israelites and said you will be a witness unto the nations as God desired to make himself known he called the ecclesia, of the church, the called out assembly. And he said, go forward and be a witness so that the world will know that I am king of kings, that I am lord of lords. He'll use fishermen. He'll use tax collectors. He'll use you and he'll use me. And when you think about this lame man that everybody was passing by, the witnesses were going to witness to a witness. <laughs> oh Lord have mercy. I'm feeling all right. The witnesses were going to witness to a would-be witness. And I'm looking at some folk out there right now as you're looking at me. I got about eight in here that are witnesses. I'm witnessing to some witnesses that if they could tell their story, they would tell you that everything ain't always been the way it is right now. And I'm talking to some witnesses that if you think back over your life, as hard as things may be right now, if you just stand still, you will see the salvation of the Lord. Even when it's difficult, stand still. Even when it's hard, stand still. Even when you don't know where to turn, 
stand still and watch how God makes a way everybody pass him by. But watch this. By the time God finished working with the witnesses, witnessing to a would-be witness, he makes his way into the temple court. And not only is he walking, he's leaping and he's giving God praise. One other thing that witnesses do is when God makes a way for you, when God provides for you, witnesses understand the power that's in their praise. You can't go back to the same thing you delivered from. You praise God on your way to a new beginning. I wish I had somebody. I know it's difficult and you don't feel like praising him, but your feelings ain't got nothing to do with God's power. If you understand that God is the same God who brought the Israelites on a crowd of sidewalk that didn't exist in the Red Sea, he can bring you out of this thing if you hold on to God's unchanging hand and be a witness for what God can do and watch the text the text says that when God got finished with him folks saw him the same man who used to sit outside the gate and begging and the Bible says they were filled with wonder and amazement about what happened to him. Yeah. You were really growing in Christ when you can praise the Lord for what happened to me. Yeah. I'm really growing in Christ when I can praise the Lord for what has gone well in your life. That Greek term that is ecstasies. It didn't simply mean that they walked by and said, mm, they look blessed. I don't mean that. It means that they stopped for just a minute and saw his praise. And they praised God with him. Not for what God did.